Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Adam Buttrick, the Metadata Curation Lead for ROAR. Um, today, I'll be leading our session on the very exciting topic of strategies for matching affiliation strings to ROAR IDs. Can you pull up my next slide, please? Um, so we have a lot of great presentations lined up today, and I want to devote as much time as possible uh, for our speakers. But to provide a little context for today's session, as ROAR has grown in popularity over the past year, we've heard quite a bit of feedback um, from our users about the challenge of reconciling affiliation strings to ROAR IDs. This challenge has also been reflected in a large volume of traffic to our affiliation service, where at last count, we're receiving about 13 million requests per month to reconcile various affiliation strings to ROAR IDs. Now, when we first built this service, it was not intended as a core feature for ROAR. And while we found that it has held up pretty well in our internal testing, about 80% accurate at the affiliation matching task. We've also been exploring how it might be improved, what other approaches are available, et cetera. Um, thankfully, many of our fantastic integrators have already been working on this problem themselves using alternate and more flexible approaches to kind of achieve a higher degree of accuracy at that affiliation matching task. So in the continued spirit of Roar's community-driven effort, we've gathered some of the best minds working on this problem to share their approaches and help us think about a future direction for the service. Can you pull up the next slide, please? Um, so again, I'm Adam Buttrick. Uh, I'm the Metadata Curation Lead for Roar um, based at Crossref. Um, today we have with us presenting Justin Barrett from our research. Um, I think you're head research scientist, is that correct? But creator of Open Alex. Um, Sergey Feldman from Allen Institute for AI, who develops Semantic Scholars Affiliation Magic Service. Uh, Mary Beth West and Joshua Nelson from the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information, which I'll now refer to as DOE OSTI for the sake of brevity, uh, who are responsible for all of DOE OSTI's internal tooling and more integration. And last but certainly not least, uh, my colleague uh, Dominika Tkachik, Head of Strategic Initiatives at Crossref, and who helped develop our affiliation matching service actually in the early days of war. So actually, absolutely great group of people. Can't wait to hear from them. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, I just want to give some brief comments on format before we move into the presentations. Each speaker will be giving uh, five to 10 minute presentations on their approach, followed by discussion at the end, including audience questions. Uh, because the topics we're discussing today can be highly technical and very easy to get in the weeds about, we'll be addressing audience questions after everyone has had a chance to present. Um, do, however, feel free to put your questions in the chat for us to circle back to. Um, presenters, you're also free to respond to any questions in the chat after your talks. Uh, we'll also have a notes document containing our presenters' slides and links to repositories that we'll send out to everyone after the session along with the recording. Okay, um, so that's all from me. So we can get over to our presenters. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, um, Justin Barrett from our research. Okay, um, is everyone able to see my screen now? Yes, I see it. Yep, you're all good. Cool. Um, so uh, my name is Justin Barrett. Um, I'm the machine learning lead uh, for Open Alex or our research. Um, I'm really the only one working on the machine learning. So uh, that's just the uh, the title I am given. Um, so basically, we're here today to talk about institution parsing. Um, we call it institution parsing, affiliation, string matching, um, any of the above terms. Um, so I think we're all pretty familiar with the problem. You get a a string in and you want to match it to some ID. So we would like to match it to our open Alex ID, um, a mag ID, a uh, roar ID. Um, and that is the first problem. And we want to try and be as good about that as we can. A second problem that we have seen in our system um, out of all the available data that we have, um, mag only matched a certain percentage of strings that were totally available. So um, you can see in that um, graph or in the chart on the bottom, uh, out of all the total data, 28% of the data had a string that was matched to uh, in mag and 13% there was a string, but mag did not assign a um, an institution to it. Um, so. Our goals for the system that we built, um, oh, sorry about that. Um, the system that we built uh, was to match or exceed the performance of MAG, um, but then also uh, more importantly for us was to fill in the gaps uh, where MAG didn't match an institution to a string. Um, and through some uh, rough calculations and sampling, uh, we 
we figured out that um, about 52% of the strings that were missing an institution match could actually be matched to an institution, uh, whereas 48% of them were either um, strings that uh, contained bad information, uh, not enough information to match to uh, certain situations like that. Um, so to jump kind of right into our solution, um, we developed pretty much an ensemble approach uh, where we developed two separate models um, a basic model, uh, so I'll, I'll refer to them as the basic model and the language model. Um, so the basic model, uh, we trained our own tokenizer, um, a word piece tokenizer that um, we believe learned um, a little bit more, um, basically which words uh, showed up more often or which parts of words showed up more often for certain institutions. Um, whereas for the language model, we used a pre-trained uh, distilled model off of Hugging Face. Um, which we believe uh, was able to use some learned information from those models to make a more um, a more educated guess about which institution uh, is showing up in the string. And so we took the predictions and the scores uh, from both of those models and we uh, performed some uh, kind of prediction or some calculations for our final prediction. And then we got a final prediction for uh, what uh, string or uh, what institution would be uh, considered the most probable in the string. Um, so our training data, uh, we have about 2 million, I think right now we're at like 220 million papers in open Alex. Um, that might be an old number uh, from back when I was training all of this data, um, but about 40% of them uh, in total throughout our database have an institution string. Um, so we use some upsampling and downsampling uh, to more evenly distribute the training data because you obviously have organizations and institutions that produce a lot more published works than some others. Um, and we wanted to make sure that uh, our model did not uh, overly focus on those institutions. We want to be able to predict the institutions that have not released a lot of papers as well. Um, so in total, after the upsampling and downsampling, um, we were training with about 5.5 million institution strings um, that were all labeled with an institution. Um, and where Roar came in for us um, is we um, augmented our training data with Roar data. Um, so basically, we took the Roar data where you have um, aliases and acronyms uh, and labels and location data, and we artificially generated affiliation strings to feed our model. Um, we thought that this would help uh, generalize the model. Uh, because there's a chance that those strings um, might not be seen uh, or might have not been seen yet um, in the data that we have. Um, but then also to help uh, future predictions for organizations that may not have published much research yet, and maybe we only have one or two institution strings from them. But if we have a Roar ID, we can maybe artificially create more to teach our model a little bit more than it would have known. Um, so I just gave a little quick example on the bottom um, for this specific Roar ID. Um, maybe you use the acronym and then maybe it's just the country or maybe it's uh, the English translated version of um, the institution and then the state that it's in um, or the city. So there's just like a lot of different combinations that you could have. Um, and we found a lot of benefits from um, using uh, this artificially created data um, when we looked and analyzed the um, the results afterwards. Um, okay, and then we also created test data sets. So um, we had our training and our validation um, data sets that we were optimizing on. Uh, but after we got through with that, um, basically created our self-labeled uh, Gold 1000 and Gold 500 data sets. So the Gold 1000 is um, 1000 institution strings that were matched to an institution in MAG. Um, we actually went through and uh, made sure the labels were actually correct because even MAG uh, still assigns some institutions uh, incorrectly. Um, so the Gold 1000 is basically just checking performance compared to MAG. And then the Gold 500 were um, institution strings that were not matched to an institution or affiliation strings that were not matched to an institution in MAG. So uh, that's basically how much we improved upon MAG. Um, so kind of cut into that slice where um, MAG was not assigning an institution to an affiliation string. 
Um, and then just, just overall model performance, um, the basic and the language uh, that you see here, those are just two different models. If we were to use them on their own, the kind of performance they would get. Um, and then the ensemble on the right is what the final uh, performance was for our model uh, by combining those two. So you can see there's a huge increase um, over using just one of the models on their own to get in an ensemble model. Um, and we were able to meet all of our goals. We outperformed MAG. Um, we assign institutions to a greater number of strings. We can see in the recall uh, improvement from MAG to the ensemble. Uh, and then we have successfully deployed it on AWS. So this is the um, system that's running live in OpenAlex right now uh, to assign institutions to, um, to, to works. And so I have questions, but I know we're saving them for the end. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll let the next person go. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome, Justin. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about uh, Open Alex's approach, do feel free to pop them in the chat and then we can circle back to them at the end of the session. Um, very clever approach, creating additional training data from the ROAR metadata, though. I was, I was, it was very cool to see in the, the white paper. Okay, uh, with that, we will turn, now turn things over to Sergey Feldman from the Allen Institute for AI, uh, who works on Semantic Scholars Affiliation Matching Service. Hi there. Is this visible? Yep, we can see it. Great. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm an applied research scientist at the Allen Institute. Um, I work sometimes on research, sometimes on models that go into Semantic Scholar to help us uh, link various metadata that we get from PDFs and metadata from uh, other folks who provide us uh, with papers, a lot of publishers send us raw affiliation strings as well. But this is the rough goal here. We just have these affiliation strings, just like everybody else. We want to assign them a good raw ID. Um, I won't go into the data part aspect here. I'll focus a lot on our contributions and the model itself. So what we have is an open source model for mapping raw affiliation strings. There's a GitHub link at the end and a bunch of data sets that we manually annotated. We have in-house annotators and they do a really great job. They're very experienced with our, our type of academic data. And we have this many strings that we picked as a kind of challenge data set, intentionally chosen that the, the answer isn't obvious. You can't just do exact matching. We have this training validation test split that hopefully others can reuse. All of this is available um, through the repo there. Okay, so this is a three-stage model, and I'm just going to walk you through each stage and what happened and what failed. First stage is named entity recognition for affiliation parts. Um, for example, here is an example of something that is real and a little challenging, kind of acronyms, a lot of confusion. There's a substring in there. Um, the output here is going to be, we find what the subaffiliation is. So this might be what is not part of the actual ROAR. The main affiliation, this would have a ROAR entry and anything that's in the address. That's, so this, this is the model that takes these three and uh, cuts them up. Uh, the way this works is we have this Roberta Large model, which is a transformer. And a, this is the first finding where we found that larger language models were very important for these uh, name, pr primarily proper nouns. And I think you know the, the previous uh, person discussed training their own tokenizer. I think that's a great idea. Maybe if we did that, our Roberta base would have been better. In any case, we have this sort of Roberta Large model, and it was trained on data that we constructed. Um, similar to the, to the previous presenter, we made our own silver data because we didn't have ground truth data. So we took our real data, and we took uh, the ROAR index, and we kind of cut stuff up and put it together. And we ended up with 140,000 labeled samples that had these uh, named entity parts, sub, main, and address. And this model was trained on those. And then we kind of applied it to the data and went back and forth a, a bunch of times. In any case, there's now a trained model and there's labeled samples, so you can, you can use them yourself if you need, but the trained model is available. Um, once we do that, we only take the main part, just at Florida International University, and we put it into a second part, which is a retrieval. So we have 100,000 plus entries in the ROAR index, and we have to find a bunch of them that we think are appro appropriate. We can't check against all of them. So this part looks up an index that we constructed of names, and it says labels and acronyms. Uh, we couldn't use off-the-shelf BM25 or something like that because it just didn't quite work. 
So I wrote my own, which is why it's slow, but it, it, ing it uh, indexes the character engrams and, and has a word index. Um, we, we compute the inverse, inverse document frequency weighting to emphasize rare engram and word matches, and that's just computed over the ROAR index itself. So we, we know what's rare because we have the ROAR index. And we also use the address here. So if the, in the previous stage, you might extract the address, we use it to filter it down. So if it's Miami, Florida, we remove all entries that aren't from Miami or from Florida because those are now becoming uh, very unlikely. At the end of this, from 100,000 plus, we have an output of 100 candidates with scores that are assembled from these IDF weights. And this part of the model has very high recall, which is by design. So 0.983% of the, percent of the time, you're going to get the correct one somewhere in the top 100 and 0.99 somewhere in the top 1,000. But the mean reciprocal rank is low. So you can't use this model, uh, the top one from it, for the, the, the final part. OK, finally, with those 100 uh, candidates, we have a pairwise re-ranker, and it's a feature-based light GBM ranker, and the features are hand-designed. Here are some examples of important features. There's maybe 20 or 30. The score from the first index is actually very important. The fraction of input matched in field. So you could imagine that if you match an acronym in the acronym field or index, that's important, and we do this for all of the various fields that are important. And we compute this fast and cheap probability of matched and unmatched input portions. We use a, an old school language model, nothing, nothing fancy that can do this in almost instantaneously. And this, again, emphasizes rare matches directly in the feature-based model. And then there's a rule where we have to say, how do we know that the model didn't find anything? It's always going to produce something at the top. And here's a rule that we arrived at after just kind of messing around in the validation set. So if the score of the top candidate is low, that means the model is not confident about it, and the top score and the second highest score are really close to each other, which means that not only are they not confident, but they're also kind of a wash. They're not that different. Nothing stands out. We just say no match found. And so the final output of this model is the re-ranked 100 results also with, with scores. We take the top one and assign that as the affiliation. And here's the performance. On the validation set, we get a precision at 1, which means the top one is correct in 0.98% uh, of the time. And the test is 0.96, which is pretty high. I don't know how this generalizes to other test sets. I think that would be nice to test. But this model seems to be doing quite well uh, in our data that we collected. Maybe it overfit to our data a little bit. We, we have to figure that out. Um, there's a great question, which is why not use a neural re-ranker, which I think is standard nowadays. And I tried really hard, and I couldn't get it to work better. Um, uh, all the transformers I tried, um, again, we needed to use a large model. They were just worse than the feature-based model, and they were slower even on the GPU. So unfortunately, we just couldn't make that work, and then manually designing features ended up being better. It's also more interpretable, as we know exactly why something is ranked, and that, that made model development a lot more straightforward for me. And, um, this is easy to use. You can just install it right now, and then this is how it works. You just import some stuff, you instantiate the models, which we provide, and then you just say predict, and you give it a list of raw affiliations, and it gives you a bunch of results. So uh, our goal as a semantic scholar is to make all our models as public and simple to use as we can as part of our mission. Um, efficiency is middling, but I think good enough, and it can be made faster. On the CPU, you get two queries a second. Named entity recognition is much faster with a GPU, and it's also faster batching. So you can see there that uh, the stage one candidate takes the longest, because I wrote that in Python, and I didn't really try to make it fast enough. But I think there's room for improvement here. Uh, but it works OK, and we, we're going to be deploying this in production pretty soon. Um, here are some to-dos. So this isn't really trained to deal with non-English affiliations. As long as you have a Latin alphabet, it still seems to work OK. But you know, it's in Mandarin. I think it's just going to do nothing, nothing good. Uh, for dual affiliations, we just look at the first one for now. We don't really have a great, uh, probably some extra work needs to be done just to combine those two somehow. Uh, we'd love to evaluate this on your data sets for all the other speakers. And we'd love for you to evaluate your models on our data set as well and have some kind of comparison. Help us make sure we're not overfitting to our data sets. OK, thank you. Here's the link. Um, I will be pasting that in the chat as well. And you can just go and try the model. 
if you have a Mac, it might not work so well. I don't know, it keeps cr crashing or something. But uh, if for a Linux production system, it works, it works great. Thank you. Great, that's awesome, Sergey. It's interesting to see the layers of approach, you know, relative to what Open Alex is doing and, and how you can kind of mix up strategies and what works off the shelf versus what you have to build yourself. So very, that's very cool. Okay, um, next up we have Mary Beth West and Joshua Nelson from DOE Asti. All right, hopefully my screen share is. You're all good. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all for having me here today. Uh, I'm Mary Beth West and I work for uh, the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information as a application development project coordinator. My colleague Josh Nelson is the lead of our, uh, our software architecture program, and he's also the AI and data engineering team lead. So today we're going to be discussing why and how we've been developing our own organization authority uh, for the Department of Energy Office of Scientific and Technical Information, and how we're using data resources uh, like WAR for that implementation. So OSTI's mission is to, con to collect, preserve, and make available DOE-funded, publicly accessible R&D uh, into our research projects. And our AI and data engineering team has been, been developing standards for how we can make the data analysis and data cleanup more efficient, which will lead to making our research products that we have more discoverable, interoperable, and reusable. So we know that we can't scale information analysis if we don't have accurate assessments of the data landscape. So it's been vital for us to ensure that the collection is complete uh, and making sure that it's as complete as possible. And there are several ways that we have been working toward that goal. So anything can, uh, that can be done to pave the way for consistency is important for adopting standards for the data exchange, which helps reduce the level of effort. And it also minimizes complications that can arise from aggregating data from disparate resources that each have their own internal standards uh, for those persistent identifiers. So one of the projects that the OSTI's AI and data engineering team has been working on is improving our internal organization authority. We actually intend to make it publicly available as a reconciliation API for DOE, interagency, and other communities to use. Uh, so what this helps us do is it helps us resolve the many entity name variations like for an organization like Oak Ridge National Laboratory or ORNL or Oak Ridge National Lab. So to that end, we've been disambiguating research and sponsoring organization references using an internally developed authority. And with good results, that scope is being expanded to include more documents and contributing organizations, author affiliations as well. And using new authorities that integrate data from WAR will allow us to also include versus identifiers from other domain cases that will lend themselves to use of natural language processing for term identification, word embeddings, uh, for establishing the equivalent standards and the important identifiers needed by the community to address similar issues related to that data access, data sharing, and data governance. So recent efforts to our organization authority have been um, in adding metadata and to improve how we disambiguate our organizations by leveraging those persistent identifiers, um, which helps us standardize the references to add funding and research organizations. As we've added PIDs to our organization authority, we, we've been able to identify additional pieces of metadata that enable us to provide our end users with more comprehensive data about our research products. So drivers for this effort include improving the findability of our research outputs uh, by enhancing our search tools through normalization of our metadata, enabling more complete organization and sector level, uh, analysis of our research products, supporting enhancements to organization data that enable meaningful analytics. Uh, for example, adding geolocation information, congressional district information, or minority serving institution data. Uh, this also makes our data more interoperable for other systems uh, and for those who use our data as we support data with uh, persistent identifiers. Uh, again, this just means that we can leverage PIDs for mapping their organization labels with ours. And these efforts also support enriching our research products as we are able to support additional metadata uh, like award DOIs or ORCID IDs. 
So to enhance our organization authority and promote our organization disambiguation efforts, we have used our existing funding and research organization authorities and are building on top of that uh, using data from other resources. Our own um, organization data is aggregated from multiple uh, authoritative resources, including ROAR, BRID, our own authorities. We're also including Wikidata, ISNI, Ringgold, and others. And after collecting this organization data, we import this aggregated metadata into our in-house authority application. Uh, this application was developed to maintain and query authoritative references with the purposes of extending that organization metadata. So recent efforts of our AI team include uh, developing disambiguation tools, uh, for example, a custom developed reconciliation API and developing natural language processing uh, or NLP tools and developing similarity and matching algorithms for our authority. Uh, to resolve vari variations of names and assign uh, authority entity data labels to those organizations that may have additional variations. And these machine learning processes also help us to further normalize labels and enhance organization metadata that are made available to downstream processes. Uh, as an example, being able to provide end users with improved metadata in our submission and search discovery tools. Um, this data, uh, organization data, is primarily uh, research organization centric, uh, as this was primarily our, our, our use case for uh, relative to the um, institution references and in Austin mission critical data. Uh, this authority combines data from ROAR, uh, again, on the or authority list. We also have our um, GIS data for resolving congressional districts, uh, Department of Ed Education, Carnegie classification data for demographic and minority serving institution data, uh, and currently supports identification of 96,000, a little over 96,000 institutions. Um, but this is currently uh, under a data refresh, and we hope to, um, and we, we should be expanding our coverage to a little over 102 uh, institutions in the future. Um, and then to reconcile organizations, we have built an organization uh, authority API. This API is built on top of the org authority data and adheres to the reconciliation API spec. Um, so for those who don't know, a reconciliation API allows uh, it to integrate with data cleanup tools like OpenRefine for automation uh, of disambiguation and cleanup tasks, uh, in addition to providing stream matching and scoring for input strings against the org authority data. The reconciliation API also provides input uh, prep and cleanup to improve that match resolution. Uh, the API includes additional parsing rules, which help to isolate the relevant part of a given input string. Uh, it also uses name, uh, named entity recognition to identify and type geopolitical entities uh, from that input string, which are used to further clean up the string for matching and provide additional matching context uh, the API of the or the current version of the API is in development, um, but it will also be implemented to include ngram based TFIDF matching and inverted uh, inverted probabil probabilistic programming um, for higher resolution at scale. Um, so this is just an example um, of taking our organization from our organization authority. Um, so um, using the data that we have, all of the information that we can. Um, breakdown as far as each of our organizations. Um, so the current status, um, you know, one of the advantages of developing our organization authority and pulling in persistent identifiers from all of these resources that we continue to evaluate and are adding additional PIDs uh, that can help us with disambiguation or, uh, of other organizations. Um, so we're currently developing this reconciliation API. Uh, we do plan to make sure that it's available for public use, um, and we hope that it will be anticipated deployment sometime this quarter, uh, hopefully by March. Uh, and if there are any questions or you have any interest in uh, talking about our org authority, we'll be happy to fill those during the Q&A. Thank you. That's great, Mary Beth. Um, it's interesting to see the kind of uh, meta hybrid authority record approach, which we see in a lot of our integrators where they're kind of synthesizing all this data and then doing the name and the recognition on country. I think that um, Open Alex has a similar thing for their matching where it's re-ranked on the basis of country. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember what I read in Justin's code. So if I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me. Um, 
Okay, uh, next up we have uh, my colleague Dominika Takacic from Crossref. Um, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep, you're all good. Great, great, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominika. Uh, I work at Crossref as the head of strategic initiatives. Um, so far in this session, we've been focusing on affiliation matching, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me that I will um, change the subject a little bit, but just a little bit. Um, I would like to talk about uh, the metadata matching in general, uh, and specifically, um, I would like to present a new service that we are planning to build at Crossref called the Matching API. Um, let me start with a little bit of context. Uh, at Crossref, every day we receive thousands of metadata records of research outputs from the publishers. We store them and serve all that metadata to the community through the APIs. Those records mention a lot of additional items, such as cited documents, authors, institutions, funders, and so on. Unfortunately, not always those items are mentioned by their identifier. Sometimes all we have is some sort of a description of an item, um, structured or unstructured, and you can see some examples of this on the slide. Um, and in those cases, it is very useful to be able to automatically link such a description to the item that has an identifier. We call this process metadata matching. Some of you may have heard that we do quite a lot of this metadata matching at Crossref. Bibliographic reference matching is perhaps the most famous example. We use it to insert citation links uh, wherever they are missing. Some less famous matching tasks include funder name matching, uh, where we link the funding information in the research outputs to funder DOIs, journal title matching, where we figure out which journal the content belongs to, preprint matching, where we try to find links between preprints and the corresponding articles published in journals, and landing page matching, which is done in event data, where we match URLs of landing pages found in sources like Reddit or Twitter to DOIs. We also started experimenting with grant matching lately, hoping that we could insert links between grants and research outputs supported by them. Um, and there are also things that we currently don't do, but we could and we might in the future, such as linking affiliation strings to raw IDs, which hopefully sounds familiar to everybody by now, and linking uh, author information to ORCIDs. Personally, I, re I really like to think about matching in a generalized way. So instead of considering reference matching and affiliation matching separate tasks, I see them um, as different kinds of the same task, something like different flavors of ice cream. Um, all this sounds great. So what is the problem? Well, to be honest, we have managed to make a bit of a mess around matching over the years. So for example, different matching functionality is exposed, um, is um, different matching bits are scattered among different services. Not all the matching functionality is exposed through the public APIs, and those parts that are, are not exposed in a unified way. We also have issues with controlling the quality of the matching processes. And because of all this, there's simply not enough transparency of our matching. Our users don't have good enough tools to match their data, and it is also almost impossible for us to incorporate community contributions, which uh, could be potentially very valuable. Um, to address all these issues, we decided to build a new matching service, unifying all the matching functionality we do internally, following the philosophy of ice cream with different flavors. The matching API will allow anyone to match different kinds of inputs to identifiers. Depending on what the user needs, the input might simply be a citation string or unstructured bibliographic reference or an affiliation string or funding information. The new service will increase the transparency uh, of our matching processes, hopefully enable us to evaluate the matching in a unified way, and potentially will open the possibility of incorporating community contributions. Just to make sure we are all on the same page, um, let me explain two terms um, that we are using a lot when we talk about matching. What we match, we call a matching task. So for example, citation matching is a matching task and affiliation matching, matching is also a matching task. Matching strategy is how the matching is actually done. And we can of course um, imagine multiple strategies available for a specific matching task. So far, we built the first prototype of this matching API. Uh, it can be used to get the list of supported matching tasks, the list of available strategies, um, and the list of strategies available for a specific task. And of course, the most exciting thing is that you can use it to perform actual matching against our collections. Here is an example matching request that can be sent to the matching API. Um, the user is expected to provide the name of the matching task that they would like to run. 
they can also optionally provide the strategy name. If they don't do that, the default strategy is used. Um, each task um, will have exactly one default strategy. And of course, the input has to be provided here. Um, the matching API doesn't really care what the input is. Everything is passed to the strategy as is, and it is the responsibility of the strategy to interpret it. And here is what the prototype currently returns. Um, we have a list of matched identifiers, each with a confidence score. Um, it is the strategy that assigns the confidence score. Um, and these scores are, of course, meant to be comparable within a single strategy, but not necessarily between strategies. Sometimes the chosen strategy will be unable to find identifiers, and I think it was uh, mentioned during one of the previous presentations. Um, for example, this particular strategy expects a full citation string on the input, and so it cannot match if only the title is given, just as it wouldn't match um, your shopping list or the name of your, of your pet to anything. Uh, in such a situation, an empty list is returned. Um, and by the way, it is also technically possible to have more than one matched identifier in this list. We currently don't use this, but it could be potentially used by some strategies, for example, to match different fragments of the input to different identifiers if the strategy has such capability. So the prototype is here, what is next for us? Um, well, we are thinking, first of all, about um, adding evaluation functionality to this framework so that it is possible to evaluate, compare, and view evaluation results of different strategies. We, of course, need to properly implement the matching strategies, and most of them will need um, some sort of an internal index of all of the data so that um, they are able to make queries against it. Uh, depending on the feedback from the users, we might consider batch processing. Um, we are also thinking about implementing ensemble strategies that would run other simpler strategies and make final decisions based on what those simpler strategies say. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and if anyone wants to get involved in building this um, matching API, uh, I would definitely love to hear from you. Great, that's awesome, Dominica. Thanks so much. Um, we're excited to see what Crossref built, and I think, you know, I know that Crossref data feeds Open Alex now, um, and lots of other services, and um, as as publishers and other people start contributing DOIs with affiliations with variety matches, it might become a kind of an important source for various kinds of training data as well for other services. So that's very cool. Okay, um, can we pull up my panel discussion slide? Okay, great. Um, so we'll move on now to kind of our panel discussion Q&A section. Um, I'm just gonna start off with one question just kind of to keep us going. Uh, uh, and then we can see what other uh, speakers have to ask each other or whatever comes in from the audience. But specifically, I just I just want to get everybody's feedback about what kind of community resource or activity um, we could perhaps collectively develop in some fashion to help improve affiliation matching. Um, for example, it came up a lot like uh, sharing validation data sets um, for testing various models. Um, similarly, we could have a data set labeling matching project for certain maybe um, affiliation strings that are uh, not supported in current models, so like CJK affiliation strings. We could obviously do some kind of competition. Um, we can do shared repositories. So anyways, um, we can start off with whoever has thoughts um, on what would be the kind of a good community resource from the panelists. And then also feel free to you know raise your hand in the audience if you have thoughts about that. So I can kind of start. Um, okay, sure. I would say, uh, personally, uh, I think the best community resource that I have seen are the emails I get telling us where our systems are wrong. Um, <laughs> sure. I know, I know that um, a lot of uh, those emails make their way to me, and then um, I kind of do some research to see if those are serious problems, if there would be nice to have in a future implementation. So. Um, I mean, that's like those types of emails are gold for me um, when we go about uh, designing improvements to our system. Yeah, I mean, that's, of course, same in the in the Roar side of things. So specifically, um, we would think about like maybe mismatched affiliation to Roar ID strings or something like that would be an important thing to capture and report. And yeah, I mean, there might be ways that obviously we can do that programmatically too, where we parse the entire open Alec data set and do some kind of procedural match, which I'm, sure, which I'm sure you already do, but that could be a problem that lots of people could work on and think about different strategies for, you know, kind of identifying those and contributing yeah. them back so you can build a better model. And then Sergey, did you have? 
Sure. I mean, you, you had a lot of great ideas. You just kind of rattled them off. I think it'd be great if <laughs> there was a centralized place where a bunch of us collected and labeled data. It would be nice if we could send it to you and you could say, here it is. It's a living a living data set that we're updating mm -hmm. and maybe you can hide the test set from us or make your own and then anybody could come back and without worrying about overfitting or without worrying that we're optimizing for the wrong thing can understand how well their model is doing. Um, I think just kind of having a, a, that centralized resource would be great for model developers. Um, also, as you update uh, API changes, I wonder if what could be done to integrate matching uh, learned lessons into future versions of the API. I mean, maybe this isn't relevant, but I could imagine a, a, a new field that says um, variants that uh, are common that cause a lot of errors. You might not necessarily want that because it might look dirty, but maybe it could be sort of something noisy variants. I don't know if you want to pollute your nice pristine data set with that, but if we could long term decrease the errors in this and everyone could become um, more certain that these affiliation algorithms become easier to make because the index itself has more capacity to deal with noise, I think it would be great. Yeah, no, that's a great insight. Uh, yeah, we've similarly talked about, um, this actually just came up in our last session about uh, possibly improving the way we do ranking and search and more based on how some of these classification models are working. So. For example, we could take the outputs of, um, you know, uh, Open Alex or Semantic Scholar affiliation matching, see how many were IDs are being, or see how many affiliations are being asserted, asserted for a given institution, and then reorder the results based on frequency of citation of that institution. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of ways that we can kind of feed those things back and forth to kind of improve both services. And I'll, I'll start thinking about how we could maybe put a repository together as well for those data sets. I do know that there. Um, one, one interesting or good source of data is that um, uh, Springer Science, who uh, Springer Nature, I should say, um, has a huge affiliation data set that was that is associated with grid IDs that we can also test against. That um, you know we can kind of see performance on. I don't know if anybody's worked with that, but I've done a little bit of testing with it. So there are also, as a result of you know Roar's CD data being based on grid, some kind of historic sources that we can pull in. But I agree that would be good to centralize though. Okay, um, Dominica or Mary Beth, did you have any thoughts? Um, I, I would probably just echo um, what, what was said so far. Uh, data is, I would say, um, would be probably the most valuable thing. Of, of course, it's not a, um, it's not a one-off effort um, because, you know, I mean, we all know how the data changes. Um, and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we would need to probably um, gather uh, gather the data periodically from time to time. Uh, I feel like that that could be useful as well. Um, I don't think it would be enough to have just like one standard data set. It would be nice and simple, but it feels like there might be um, potentially different different sources, um, different use cases, slightly different use cases, different needs um, with different with slightly different data. So multiple data sets. That's that's what comes to mind. Yeah, um, and I think that Roar can maybe play a role in aggregating some of those because I know that we frequently have contact with, um, you know, various projects kind of similar to Crossref on a national level, such as DOI registrars that have um, data that might not be available in other sources. So I'm thinking specifically, we were just working with um, the Japan Science and Technology Agency, and they have uh, a data set of, you know, Japanese affiliation strings that have English language pairs. So we can do things like classify the English language and then kind of pass that affiliation or that raw ID over to the Japanese string and create kind of data sets that way. So we can look at how we can kind of identify those gaps because I know especially the CJK problem is, is really difficult for people. Um, I don't want to leave you out, Mary Beth, but <laughs> if, you, if you don't have any additional thoughts, and, and Josh, too, can echo in, I, you know, just, um, you know, very much echoing a lot of what we hear, you know, what I've heard so far. And then as far as just other things, you know, we're constantly updating our own authority because we're receiving information, too. So adding additional canonical labels and, and, and looking at ways that we can, you know, add to our own data set so that we can share those with others. It's been important. Josh, I'm not sure if you had anything else to add. Yeah, I was just not wanting to talk over you because I have a bad habit of doing that on accident. But um, they, so I, yeah, I think um, 
you know, the same as everyone else here has remarked, uh, you know, a, any kind of, you know, central, you know, location for sharing some of these types of resources would be phenomenal. Um, and I think there's a, one of the things that sort of impressed me uh, or impressed itself on me um, and, and also impressed me um, going through, um, you know, listening to, to these other talks is, you know, how, how similar uh, a lot of these, uh, a, a lot of the same issues are. I mean, I think, I think we've all, you know, trod over a lot of the same ground uh, and had a lot of the same experiences in terms of, you know, how to achieve some of the best results. Um, and so a lot of the things that, um, you know, I, I, our presentation was probably a little less technical, but a lot of the technical details from the other presentations were, were really resonating with us, you know, in terms of like, you know, uh, you know, generating uh, a aliases and training data from, from existing, you know, canonical data. And, you know, yes, you know, large language models are absolutely, you know, better and probably critical for doing any R stuff, you know, for the, for these types of strings. Um, yeah, and so and, and dealing with some of the same issues. I mean, it, it sounds very familiar. It's like, you know, yes, what what's the correct threshold for determining an actual no match condition? And and yeah, let's back burner, you know, dual affiliations for right now. That's tomorrow's problem. Uh, so I mean, I think there's uh, there, there, there's a lot of 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 common experience, and we're all sort of you know, wandering uh, through. Uh, I, I think I think we're we're taking a lot of the same approaches in some ways uh, to some of these things. And so I think there's the the amount of overlap and common ground. Um, was uh, I, I guess that that impressed itself on me as as, as some of you guys were were going through your presentations, which were were excellent, by the way. Uh, so yeah, I mean any type of resource that you know uh, that that we could share, you know the the test data sets we use. I particularly like the idea of a companion data set for noisy aliases and things like that. We would love that. I mean we've we've got something of that that we use for our own selfish purposes here, but being able to share that type of information with uh, with a group of people that have you know, really the same, uh, the, the same, you know, interest in and and, and uh, intended outcomes would be fantastic. Uh, that was too many words. I didn't mean to use that many words. But uh, yeah, I, th I think, uh, I, I guess, that, you know, what I'm saying is that, you know, I think if 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 a central resource could be created uh, with a group like this uh, and and the commonality of the issues that we face, I think that'd be spectacular. Uh, and we would love to support that. Yeah, that's super great. And I think that, you know, um, similarly, we could i i I would essentially just be copying uh, Justin's approach, but there are ways that we could create, like, for example, kind of ongoing faked affiliation data sets as we update the registry, you know, where we automatically just parse out the data dump. So that's available as kind of a supplement for additional tools. Mary Beth and Josh, do you know, um, for example, when you are kind of making a reconciliation API public, are you going to make your org uh, authority database public as well as a resource, or is that kind of internal to DOE OSTI? Uh, so the, the short answer is yes. Uh, it's uh, it's just a question of, of, of timing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's uh, you know, we we have uh, sort of a different uh, review and release uh, and, and deployment process uh, for software and software services versus uh, data sets and, and things of that nature. Uh, but yes, that, that that has always been uh, our our plan internally, and our senior staff is 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 fully on board with that. Uh, so we're planning to to make the the service publicly available, but also the data. Okay. That's great. Yeah, and I, I saw that Justin just put in chat that the open Alex data is kind of fully available. So you can actually do, and which I've done, um, you know, extract out all of the affiliation strings in where ID pairs, which is very cool to see. And you can do some kind of analysis about how those are being paired. And um, so that's really cool. That's another kind of, we could probably also make some tools available to help users, you know, parse those large data sets and everything, because, you know, it takes a lot of time, obviously, to work through the open Alex corpus, which I think is like 300 gigabytes or something like that. Um, but, you know, we could, we could parse that out into a, a kind of ongoing uh, kind of updated affiliation data set. So that's very cool. Okay, um, everyone in the everyone in the in the chat is, seems to have been pretty quiet, but I don't want to you know have us kind of monopolize all the conversation. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to raise your hands, and we can we can address or answer. Okay, I'm see. Is it Sarah who raised? Sorry, I'm trying to see. Maria, can you see who? My, my Zoom's being a little bit weird. I think it was Amanda. Oh, okay, Amanda, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I have my hand raised. Um, actually, this is for Sergey, actually. Um, you mentioned that you were trying to use, let's see if I get the term right, neural rankers, and that they just didn't work, and that was why you had to sort of uh, bake your own. Can you speculate on why it was that those didn't work? Yeah, my best guess is 
um, I think it's related to the tokenization. They were trained on um, broad language, and these are just string proper nouns all smashed together um, in ways that I think don't appear regularly in the data sets used for these kinds of language models. So they just were not the great initial condition. Um, I think we probably could have done something like we retra retrained the tokenizer and maybe pre-train on all the affiliation data we had in Semantic Scholar. And, but after throwing myself at it for a while, I just retreated back into 2011 and it worked great and so <laughs> faster. Um, but yeah, I think that I think the models are just not, they're not really for proper nouns, I think is, is my best hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Especially, yes. you know, not like GB, it's not GPT-3. These are 300 million models, not 175 billion models. And we can't afford to send GPT-3 to everything. I'm sure that that would do better. Right. Yeah, I mean, not the same case, but we find the same thing in, you know, like search systems like Elasticsearch. It just doesn't, out of the box, does not do well with strings that are different than just, you know, text, that paragraphs full of text or something. The names of organizations are special and need special handling yeah and to go to kind of take off from your 2011 comment when i was looking at the japanese language data and seeing what approaches when i tried to use um a bird based model that came out of tohoku university or something i found that it was it was quite bad at doing the same kind of tokenization for those proper now Japanese language strings as the same kind of problem that you're having in English. And I defaulted to actually using a very kind of basic procedural similarity search for, you know, kind of this Japanese string associated with this Roar ID and got pretty good results. So sometimes actually, you know, I we all love machine learning because it's the rage or something, but sometimes as obviously your presentation indicated, you got to supplement it with a little bit of kind of old school or home-baked stuff. I did actually have a separate uh, question for Dominica, but I can let someone else go. Thanks. Yeah, Kevin just had a question in the chat. So let's um, let's see what he was saying. Um, so Kevin's uh, making a point about um, we need to get higher up in the publishing pipeline, get authors to state their affiliations in an unambiguous way, um, including, you know, obviously using persistent identifiers and passing that data along. And that is something that we're working on, um, Kevin, with all kinds of publisher and service provider partners, some, you know, kind of capturing that data at the highest level possible so that, you know, that we have actually good training data for doing machine affiliation things and just also so that the data is obviously represented kind of more correctly in general. Um, so probably, you know, throughout this year, we'll, we'll probably have a lot of big announcements about more of those integrations. We just had Scholastica, which is a big academic journal provider, talk about their integration of varieties, which should then, you know, kind of, uh, pass that data along into the various feed sources um yeah but that's that's definitely something that we're working on um but we also have this problem of you know massive amounts of legacy data that people want to associate with PID. so we're thinking about how we can tell so we we hear from both places the um getting people to implement roar and assign those ids is is definitely something that we always kind of work on and strategize but then they they always say yeah but we have you know 50 years of of scholarly metadata that we have to figure out ourselves it, uh, is it on your radar to use maybe the best technique at the end of 2023 to help those publishers solve that to say, hey, we have a service for you. Just send us all your raw strings and we'll map it for you. And we hope it'll be pretty accurate. Or are they concerned about any errors whatsoever? Uh, I'll let Liz talk about it. <laughs> so it, it really varies from publisher to publisher. Um, you know, there's not kind of a, a uniform kind of mentality about that. You know, like, for example, I actually like I kind of ported Justin's model over into fast text so that it could um, uh, so that we could kind of parse masses amounts of data really quickly at a slightly lower rate of accuracy than how open Alex this model actually works, you know, but we could run that through a data and some publishers are like yeah this is great that's fine, you know, I don't care. Other publishers are like no, it has to be, I mean, 100% correct or you know some threshold which will never be, you know, super high so it really kind of you know just depends on the publisher variability, I do think that as we kind of make this problem kind of more visible and expose it and kind of work on strategies that that might kind of um, change a little bit such that people are a little bit more comfortable with things being accurate but in the feedback loop where they're being corrected you know mm -hmm. over time mm -hmm. because the reality is in these various internal systems 
you know, whether they be publisher systems or, you know, things that are, you know, other persistent identifiers that have been reconciled to affiliation strings. There's lots of wrong stuff that people just never see, you know, so they don't actually know that it's wrong. Um, and it's just that Roar kind of being public and trying to solve it publicly is exposing all of those things that exist everywhere. So anyways, Liz, sorry to... Yeah, I will say that we're looking at at options and, you know, part of the the sneaky self-serving motivation for this this meeting session was to, you know, get folks together in a in a room who are all working on these these similar things. Um, so we do run an affiliation string matching service right now that it has a lot of limitations because it doesn't know it uses just data in raw records and does not know anything about what actually constitutes a a good match between a string and a and a raw record. So uh, its accuracy rate is around eighty percent, which is kind of okay, but not uh, not great. So users of that are not, you know, there there are a lot of people using it, but some people are not particularly pleased with the accuracy rate. So we're entertaining um, some options for replacing that. The realities of um, you know, taking some of the things that like Adam has has stood up as prototypes and you know combining some different ideas from from folks in the community into a public facing service that doesn't cost a huge amount of money are you know those remain to be seen we have to do some definitely some evaluation and testing to figure out whether it's uh, reasonably possible for a small team like Roars to run that kind of service and to also you know, fund that kind of service. Um, that said, it seems like there would be interest in that sort of thing because that's where the bulk of our API use is right now. Although we, on the flip side, there are particularly among some of the larger publishers, they wanna do the stuff themselves um, mm -hmm. just because that's how they, they do things. Um, so even running such a service, um, whether it's you give your data to us and we'll process it, or there's um, you know, a way that you can submit data directly to the service and get results back, eh, may or may not fly with some organizations. Um, but suffice it to say, we're thinking about it and we'll be exploring it. Um, could help with the publisher uptake. The A challenge with uptake by publishers is um, not necessarily just the technology part of it, because there are certainly a bunch of parts and pieces along the publishing process that perfectly well support Roar identifiers. Um, JAT supports affiliation identifiers. Various metadata formats support it. There's a really, really long tail of technologies and software that tend to be pretty old and a little brittle in those processes. And a lot of publishers have tools that are all pinned together. So if the data comes in in the front end in a lovely, delightful, structured format, doesn't always mean it gets all the way through the publishing process uh, mm -hmm. to the output because one or more of the tools or systems along the way may be um, you know, older, not in the control of the publisher necessarily. So metadata starts to fall out of the um, fall out in the process of a particular point along the way, can't handle it, it sometimes just gets uh, dumped. So there is a very long tail of tools to, <laughs> to address in the in the publishing process that doesn't always, uh, maybe we can get the submission systems and it doesn't always. Uh, Which is one reason why the magic service Domenica was talking about is kind of crucial because. Yeah. yeah right back in. Yeah, and I, but I also think that, you know, if, as a community effort, we can kind of develop maybe a reference model or a set of reference models of, hey, this is possible or something. Um, it can, it can help, you know, with some of the biggest uptaker, uh, you know, uh, integrators of Roar don't have anything to do with kind of tr the traditional academic publishing companies, you know, we have it in all kinds of European research contexts, all over, and other research contexts all over the world, so they can make use of that, you know. Um, to reconcile their data. So I think that even independent of what publishers might do or what integrator what we might offer as a service, kind of having it available as kind of, like I said, a reference model would be incredibly useful. Um, so we're at time. Uh, this was absolutely great. And I thank everyone so much for putting this together and, you know, kind of getting into the weeds of all the technical details. It was super informative.
And we'll start kind of strategizing ways, maybe on the Roar side, that we can pull together some of those community resources that we talked about, and we can follow up with our presenters and anybody else in the meeting who you know might be interested. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And um, uh, this is the last annual meeting session of the year. So thanks to everyone for, who came to all of our meetings, um, aside from this one. And we look forward to staying in touch in all the nor normal Roar community channels. Um, but otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll see you again next year with maybe uh, an update on how we're doing new wild and crazy things with affiliation. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Adam.